Hey everyone, welcome to this AI 102 Designing and Implementing a Microsoft Azure AI Solution. And when you pass that exam, you get the Azure AI Engineer Associate Certification. So shiny new artificial intelligence certification for you. Now it's a two hour exam, but that two hours includes 20 minutes for survey time. So the actual exam time is only one hour 40. I had 42 questions and I actually finished in 30 minutes. So my point is when you do this exam, take your time because you have a lot of time. One hour 40 doesn't sound that much, but it is only 42 questions. They are fairly short in types. It's not a huge amount to have to understand and comprehend. And I finished in less than a third of the time. And that's just because I was in a bit of a hurry anyway, but you have a lot of time. So you can really take your time on every question. Um, I did pass and you get now this shiny little link you can use if you're kind of curious. So this is the page for the exam. So this is the AI 102. And I, I did the exam yesterday morning, you can see it was um, July 15th if I actually passed it, but you get this little page now you can refer other people to to prove you have. So it's online verifiable, you actually did take this exam. Now I definitely recommend you go through this AI 102 page. And specifically, I would go through this self-paced learning make sure you click the see more button because there are lots of different modules. But if you go through all of these modules, I think you'll pass. It has all of the information you need. Now you should also look at the skills measured. You'll also see you have this study guide. Now if you look at the study guide, it breaks it down into more detail about exactly what skills it is going to test. So you wanna be able to go through this and tick off, say, oh yeah, I understand that, I understand that. I'm good, I, I feel confident I can do those various things. Now, in terms of what the exam is, there is no hands-on coding as such. There is no lab. Now, there'll be questions where it shows you a piece of code and it will ask you at the start, do you wanna use C Sharp or Python? And then based on which one you pick, that's what the examples and the questions will be in. So it may show you a piece of code, maybe you have to select what function you use or what endpoint you'd want to use or what is this code doing? So you need to be able to understand code as part of the exam, but you're not actually just sitting there writing any. But again, if you go through that self-paced learning, there are hands-on labs as part of that. Now I didn't do any of them, but I went and looked at the GitHub repo to get an idea around it. But you should, you should go through those hands-on labs and it will get you the experience you'll need to handle all of those coding type questions. Now, I'm not gonna go through the labs, there's no point, but you should, it walks you through step by step of exactly what you're gonna do with really nice sample code in C Sharp and Python. And as I mentioned, you do have a lot of time, so take your time. And if you don't know the answer to something, just think logically. Microsoft do not design these technologies to try and trick up developers trying to leverage the solution. So it's always gonna be logical. So think about well, what's the logical, likely sequence of events gonna need to be to achieve something? Because that's some of the questions. Hey, here's all the possible actions you could do. Which ones do you need to use and what order should they be in? So just think what makes the most sense? Understand the endpoint naming structure. For example, they're all something.cognitiveservices.azure.com. Understand what each service does. Often what we're gonna need to do is leverage multiple solutions to solve a problem. Hey, I want you to, I don't know, take this collection of books and translate it into a bunch of different languages. Well, okay, so on one hand, I've got images of a whole bunch of books. I need to consume large amounts of text. That's probably the read API. And I need to do translation to multiple language. Okay, well then there's the translation services. So I'd probably wanna bring those in. So just think very logically, how would I solve the problems? So you need to understand what this is. So if we actually look at what is the AI 102, it is the whole point around an AI engineer. So when we think about an AI engineer, well, I need to have experience in development. 
And specifically, this is gonna be focused on, I need to know either C Sharp or Python. I don't need to know both, but I need to know one of those. I need to understand one of those languages, be able to develop in one of those languages. I need to be okay with the idea of calling APIs. For example, a RESTful MPI. I'm doing a put or a post, a get to a URI. It has certain structure to that URI. I have a JSON body and then I'm gonna get a JSON response back. So I need to be good with the idea of using an API and also using a software development kit. And often a software development kit abstracts away that API for me and I'll have software development kits available for many different languages. So I need to be familiar with those concepts. I wanna understand the idea of DevOps. So when I think of DevOps, I'm thinking of the idea of source and version control with things like GET. I wanna think about pipelines. So I have the idea of a continuous integration, a continuous deployment, continuous delivery. Be good with those key concepts. Now, one of the things we'll hear time and time again when we think about the idea of artificial intelligence is this concept of responsible AI. So I wanna be very familiar with what are those considerations. And we're hearing about it a lot in the news right now. If you think about the GPTs, the large language models, and hey, what does all this mean? Well, they have a great example of highlighting some of the concerns about it. But we always think about fairness. So with fairness, the idea that an AI system should treat all people the same. There should be no bias on gender or race or authenticity. There should be no unfair advantage or disadvantage to any specific group of applicants. So as part of our training of those, we need to make sure we have the right data to not influence the model in those ways. We need to think about reliability. and safety. The more we use these systems, they need to perform in a reliable, a safe manner. Think of an autonomous vehicle. Again, we see those a lot in the news. Well, imagine that wasn't safe. There's this human life at risk in those scenarios. Imagine it's a model that diagnoses the health of a patient. If it wasn't done very well, it might miss a diagnosis and we cause a loss of life. So we need to ensure there is no unreliability in these systems. There needs to be rigorous testing and deployment management as part of those. Privacy. So privacy and security. Once again, the idea that they should respect privacy. We have these models and we train the models on huge amounts of data. If you look at again at these GPT models, they took huge amounts of public domain data, book databases, uh, Wikipedias, you name it. They use that data to train the model, but we need to ensure as part of that personally identifiable information is kept private. We don't expose things we should have. When we think about private use of the models, we're always making sure that, hey, if I'm using my data in my blob storage account, I wanna make sure it's not being used to train the model or could be exposed to other people as part of its predictions, its inferences going forwards. So that's a really important component of that. We think about the idea of inclusiveness. Inclusiveness. Sometimes I can't spell early in the morning. Inclusiveness. So all systems should empower everyone. It should engage all people. Every part of society, ideally, regardless again of any gender or authenticity or maybe even physical abilities, should be able to take advantage and leverage this. Transparency. I should understand how it's doing, um, how it's working, 
What is the purpose of this system? Are there limitations? Now, as we get more and more into GPT models, we don't always understand how they do what they do. We have billions, maybe trillions of parameters. And although we know how we design the model, we're not 100% sure how it does some of what it does. Um, but transparency should be key. And then accountability. We should be accountable for the AI systems we're using, the designers, the developers. There should be a framework of governance, of principles that the solution meets from an ethical perspective. Um, legal standards are clearly adhered to. So that's a really important part of all of this. Okay. So there's some of the core concepts um, that we're thinking about as part of this. So when we talk about AI, what exactly is then artificial intelligence? So, hey, we say this AI. And the whole point of artificial intelligence, it is software that exhibits human-like capabilities. So this is the fundamental goal of AI. It should be able to do things that we as humans can do. And we'll often break those into different areas. So I could think, well, for one component of that, visual perception. I can look at a picture and tell you it's a car. I can um, maybe understand something around, is it a happy image? I can understand video. I can extract text from a picture. We think about the idea of language. I can't spell it all this morning. Language. Language, even. So with language, you have the idea to use natural language processing to not just read, but understand the semantic meaning from text-based data, actually understand the goals around it. I can also think of speech. Both hearing speech and then being able to create text from it, having text and be able to then synthesize and speak that. But also I can think about, well, taking that step further with conversational AI. And then we have the idea of decision making. As a human, I can look at a trend and say this is normal, and then there's something outside of that normal range. I'm passing a certain threshold that triggers an alert in my mind. So I could think about, hey, an inference, a prediction, detect those anomalies, as part of decision making. Now, when we think about artificial intelligence, we often say it's machine learning. We combine those things together, but AI builds on top of machine learning. So if we have AI, really it's built on top of machine learning. And machine learning is all data and algorithms. That's the key point. So we have, the, we have huge amounts of data and it's really built on data science, which we'll talk about in a second, but we use this data to train prediction, models. I mean, that's the fundamental goal of what we're doing here. We have data that we label correctly, we train the model with that data, and then once we've trained the model, and we've tested it with other data that's labeled, see if it gets it right or not, and we can tune that, we deploy the model, then we can feed it in new data, and it will predict based on the correlation that it's learned in the past. So this is really the, the key goal around that's what machine learning is, and AI builds on top of that idea. And then machine learning itself is just built on top of data science. 
And of course, data science is really just math and statistics um, to analyze data. And it's interesting if you take a step back, and I did a deep dive video into what is ChatGPT. And if you, if you keep going back far enough down, it's really just billions of different parameters in layers. And a parameter is just a fairly simple statistical algorithm that represents a particular part of a data set. And by adding different stretching and cropping of elements of that algorithm, when we put them all together in the layers and billions of them, it really can just do remarkable things. And that's the key around all of this. Now, if we then think about Azure and the services where this applies, the most basic one is just Azure Machine Learning. So if we think of just this machine learning, we do have Azure ML. And Azure ML is just that idea of I have data, that I have labeled. So it's my training data. Maybe it's also, I'm gonna have data which is gonna be used for the testing. So I'll split my core data set into data used for training and then data to test the model that I trained to see how, if it's working and tune it if I need to. But I take that data and I use it to train the model. So from that training, I get a model. And then with that model, once I'm happy with it, I deploy it. But potentially then I'll, I'll deploy it as a web service, which I can then use through different applications, however I need to, to pass in new data that it can then do that prediction on based on the correlations it finds from how it's been trained. But that may then feed back into then I'm, I'm tuning, bringing more data in to train the model to make it better and better. So that's one of the, the key goals around it. So if I actually think then about going beyond just raw Azure machine learning and what it can do, how can I really start to think about using um, the Azure technologies around AI? So if I was to break it down into what I would think about some of the real core services around all of this, I'm actually going to give myself a little bit more room for a second. Let's give myself a bit more space. So if we think of the Azure services around this, obviously the big service we have right here is the Azure Cognitive Services. Now, these include a huge range of different capabilities. And what we're gonna do is really go through all of what those services are. Firstly, at a high level, and then we'll come back and go into detail about them. So if we start with the idea of visual perception. So the first thing we have is the idea of, well, we have image analysis. Here's a picture, give me information about it. The category of the image, tags in the image, um, where are objects in the image. Likewise, we can do the same thing for video. But also then I might wanna break it up into different scenes. Maybe I need to understand what is in the content of that image. I also have the idea of image classification. We can train it on our own labeled images and then give it new images that it will give us the classification for this hierarchy of classifications. Object detection. Where in this image is the specific object? What are the coordinates, a bounding rectangle of where an object is. 
facial analysis. Wear of faces, information about that face, um, detect and verify the same faces in multiple pictures, or maybe even recognize specific individuals. And then of course, OCR, optical character recognition, is a very important um, technology. So we have all of these around the idea of our visual perception. Then when we think of language, well, language has a, a huge broad range of different components to that. I can absolutely think about, well, language, understanding. And there are many aspects to language understanding, which we were going to dive into a lot of detail on. But as a sub part of those, well, we have basic thoughts of, well, question, question answering. I might think about text analysis. And then a huge part of this is translation. So many different aspects just when we think of language. And again, we're commonly going to combine these with other services. We come on around the other side, and as we talked about the idea of speech, well, again, there are some fairly obvious ones when we think of speech. There's obviously, hey, it's hearing speech, and it has to give us the actual text, a file. But then there's also the reverse where we need to synthesize. So we have text that we want to speak. So we can go the other way. But there also could be the concept of speech translation. We have uh, an incoming speech in one language. We want to go out and convert it to one or many number of target languages and maybe even speaker recognition. So we can identify the individuals that are speaking as part of speech. Now imagine we were trying to transcribe a conversation. If we can detect the individuals, well now we can make that transcript so much richer when we can actually identify the individual, hey, Bob is talking, John is talking, etc. And then if I think of decision making, well, we break that into the idea of um, anomaly detection. So it's outside of what we would expect. Maybe it's machine hardware and we, the temperature's rising. Maybe it's one signal, maybe it's multiple signals that fire into that. I can think of content moderation. And that's important when we think about maybe there's text or images that we want to make sure is suitable for the audience. And even the idea of content personalization. If I'm doing a shopping cart, let me recommend things you're really, really interested in. So you'll then go and buy them and, and give me your money, which would be very nice. Thank you. So those are some of the services we can go and then build a solution on top of. But in addition to the things that I could use to build my own nice solution, which I, I absolutely can do, there's also a number of pre-built solutions that I can essentially deploy and it's ready to go. I don't have to do much. And we're gonna, again, we'll come back and look at these in detail, but I can think about things like the forms recognizer. So I can give it a form and it will understand it and extract the information, put it maybe into a database. Metrics, advisor. So a service built on the anomaly detector cognitive service to actually then give me real time monitoring and a response to critical metrics. video analyzer, 
for media. Again, built on top of other services, but makes it easier for me to go and get analysis based on video content without me having to go and build my own solution. I can think about the immersive reader. Different ways to take text and make it more accessible. Maybe it spreads the text out in different ways. Maybe it can show me pictures of different elements of it. But all ages, all abilities help them with reading certain content. But think about the bot service. And I think we've all probably experienced a, a bot somewhere in our interactions with computers. But it's the whole idea about some kind of conversational interaction. So it's delivering an interaction with the customer. So it's AI powered and we see these all over the place, there's different channels. So we might see this in, for example, a web chat. I might see it through email interactions. There, I might see it through Teams. And there's others. So there are different ways I can interact with these conversational models. So I can have different channels for the same bot. And then a huge, huge service is Cognitive Search. Now, cognitive search is all about the idea that you have data and that data you're going to ingest. Now, what happens is you ingest that data in and an indexer uses it to create an index. And then what I can now do is, hey, I can run different types of search against that index to get a result. Now, I don't just have to have the raw index, there's actually capabilities that I can enrich the index. I could maybe take an image, I could run it through uh, optical character recognition, gain more insight from that, add it to the inset, into the index. I might translate certain fields so it's available in multiple languages. So again, I could hook into other things but there's many different aspects to actually leverage. And we're gonna come back to all of these and talk about all of them in more detail so we can really understand, hey, what are the benefits and how do we think about getting the most from this? But to start with then, okay, we have this idea, great, of this Azure Cognitive Service. How, how do we actually use this Azure Cognitive Service? So what we have to do to leverage it is it lives in an Azure subscription. So if I think I have, okay, my, my Azure subscription. Which is a, essentially a billing boundary for many things. I'm gonna deploy, provision my service to a specific subscription. And within there, I can use many of the different regions. So I'm going to provision an instance of my service into this. And what that's going to give me is my resource, my cognitive service resource. Now, when I create this, and I guess one of the things to think about for a second is when I use the region, there are many regions throughout the world. If we quickly jump over to the portal, let's have a quick look. So if I'm in my portal, if I was to quickly open up a cloud shell, so this is a way to interact with Azure using PowerShell, or I can use the AZ CLI. But if I just quickly paste this command, this shows me all of the regions. So there are many, many regions that I can leverage in Azure. Notice when we provision things, we always use the name, not the display name. So get used to the idea of using this short name, like East US 2 or West US 2. 
We're not saying East Space US Space 2. So yes, there's a nice friendly display name, but really what we focus on when we l use the service is we're gonna use that short name. That's really how we interact when we provision things, you'll always use that short name. Now, when we create a resource, we have a choice. Our resource can either be multi-service or it can be single service. Because remember, we drew this picture of all of these different services. Now, if it's multi-service, the nice thing here is it's a single endpoint because we're gonna interact with a RESTful endpoint to call our services. So it's gonna be a single endpoint with a single access credential. Whereas if I do a single service, well, the single service will be a different endpoint for every single instance. There'll be a different set of keys for every single instance. I could use different regions, different billing for every single instance. And also note, so I'll do a little note here, training, may require, or maybe you want to, a different resource. What I mean by that is, we talk about this multiple stages, we train a model, then we use a model. So it's very common, maybe for billing, I want to do the training in one model and see how much that costs me and charge that a certain way, then the consumption of the model, I might wanna do a completely different way. So if I jump over to the portal, if we see cognitive services for a second, we have all these individual ones. So for example, computer vision, I could just create a computer vision resource and you can see uh, I've got different aspects to it as different pricing tiers. Now, when it's an individual, I get both standard and a free option. A free limits me to a certain number of uses, but as the name suggests, it, it doesn't cost me anything. It's a nice free way to do that. So I do a name, a region, and for what I want to do. But likewise, if I just do custom vision for a second, notice with custom vision, I could, if I wanted to, break it up. I could create a version of resource that is only used for training, and then a completely different one that I would then go and use for the actual prediction elements of it. So these are all examples of I'm creating a resource that's specific to a service. But there's also the ability down here at the bottom to have a multi-service. So with the multi-service, there is no free option. If we look at the creation, my pricing tier is standard. That there is no free option when it's the multi-service here. But the benefit, if I look at my multi-service, the multi-service has its endpoint. And again, my endpoint is the name of my service, and then it's that dot cognitive services.azure.com, and then it has its two keys. If I was to look, let's just go up here for a second, uh, with my ones that aren't multi. So I've got one that's just computer vision, one that's just speech. Well, these would have their own endpoint and their own keys just specific to that service. So maybe we wanna split up the billing or maybe we don't, maybe you just want it all in one place, but we have the choice in how we want to leverage those. Now, when we talk about this idea of, I showed you the idea of the keys and the endpoint. So a key aspect will be our resource right here has some very important aspects to it. So one is that endpoint URI. I have to know that. Whenever I'm interacting with a service, I have to know that endpoint URI. Often I'll need to know the region as well. And remember, there are the two keys. Now, why are there two keys? So we have these two keys. 
The reason there are two keys is I have to specify a key when I use the service. Well, if I want to rotate the keys, the idea is I would switch to start using key one. While I'm using that, I would rotate, i.e. regenerate key two. Once key two is finished rotating, I would update the apps to now use the new key two, and then I could go and regenerate key one. So it's a way to not interrupt the usage of the service. And there are commands I can use to go and fetch the keys. There are REST APIs. So for example, if I wanted to regenerate a key, we can see I'm posting here to the management endpoint. But what I'm basically doing here is, hey, I want to regenerate the key of my particular cognitive service account. And in the body, I would put the key name. So do I want to regenerate key one or key two? So that's one of the ways I could think about, hey, I want to go and regenerate that. Now, a very common pattern, now this is not part of Azure Cognitive Services, but one of the, the very common things we will do is you could imagine what I'll actually have is an Azure Key Vault. And what I can do is I can store the key in my Azure Key Vault and then apply role-based access control, which means only certain service principles have rights to get that key. Now, it could be a managed identity where it's native to a resource, or it's just a regular service principle that, that anyone could go and use. Um, now, sometimes some services use a token that's maybe time limited to 10 minutes, and I have to use the access keys to get a new token. If I use software, the SDKs, it does that for me. Some of them even use Azure AD for the authentication to use the service. It varies. You'd want to actually go and check exactly how that is working for the individual service. Now, remember, when we interact with this, it's talking to that endpoint URI. Now, one of the things we can do is this endpoint URI does have its own firewall in front of it. So one of the things I could do is restrict it to only certain public IPs. I could also restrict it to a service endpoint. So what uh, a service endpoint does is if I have a virtual network, it has subnets. Now ordinarily on a firewall, I couldn't restrict it to the IP range of a virtual network. So they're private IP ranges, it would mean nothing to the firewall but I can go and tag subnets, so I'd have to make a change on the virtual network on a particular subnet, say, hey, I want to enable you for a particular Azure Cognitive Service, and then that particular subnet would be visible in the firewall to say, yes, I want to let you through. So I could use service endpoint to restrict it to only certain subnets in a certain virtual network. We could also use private endpoints. A private endpoint completely disables the public endpoint, and now there's a virtual NIC created in my VNet that points to a specific instance. And some of the services need a special configuration. If we look at the documentation, it talks about all of the services that have, that are supported by this cognitive services management service tag, which I can use again on that subnet but then maybe there are certain services that need certain special permissions, and it just goes through that in this document. So it's, it's really a nice thing to just understand how those interact with each other. Okay, so then how do we use this service? So if we think about, well, there's me on my machine. So maybe I'm sitting over here, and I want to use it. Now remember, the whole point is we have this endpoint URI. Now I have to know the endpoint URI and I have to know one of these keys. So I can't do anything without that. So I've got one of the access keys. Now, maybe I know it, maybe it's in the config file. We don't wanna put things in a config file. Ideally what's happened is this is running as some resource or service principle 
and I actually go and did a read from the key vault to get the key that I'm going to use. So what I now do is my interactions with this are going to be using maybe rest. So one option here is I'm using rest. Now remember rest has, I can do puts, post, there's a whole bunch of different verbs I can use here. But what it boils down to is we are creating a JSON payload wrapped in HTTP. And what I'm first doing is I'm creating a request. So my request, I send to the endpoint. And then its response will come again as JSON um, over HTTP, HTTPS, it's gonna be encrypted. So this is one option. I just use REST directly. And if we go and look for a second at some of the examples, so this is the Git repo for the, the free training. And the key thing we see, so if we look at the app settings, what are the two things I have to tell it? The endpoint and the key. And that's gonna be the same no matter what I do. But then once I've done that, my actual program, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but it has to take those settings and then it's going to construct a JSON payload. So we can see it's creating this JSON body. It's gonna put in the information it wants and then it has to construct, okay, these, um, it's going to send this data to it. There'll be a response coming back. So we can see this status code. We did this post over here. We created the header and it was a type application JSON. So we do all this work around the RESTful interaction. So, okay, and we can do that. And now the benefit here obviously is this works from anything. When I think about using that idea, I can do this from any, like I could use Postman. I could just go and play around with this. I could use curl. There's no limits to what I can do. So no matter what I'm using, I could use the REST endpoint. But there's, there's some work involved in that and I lose some of the benefits. For example, again, the SDK, if there was that 10 minute token, it does it for me. I can just now call a native function. So my other option, instead of using the REST, or I'm gonna use an SDK. Now the SDK is available for things like C Sharp, and Python, I think there's JavaScript. You'd have to check um, all the languages, Go, Java, there's a whole bunch of them. And what the SDK is really doing is abstracting the rest. I'll still need to give it the endpoint. I'll still need to give it a key, it doesn't change that. But now I can do all of my interactions in a far more friendly language specific way. So if I now looked at the same code for the SDK, I still need to do exactly the same endpoint and service key. I still need those things. But now my program is gonna be a lot simpler. Now, well, it creates a client which is just talking to the endpoint of my credential and then it just calls this detect language and I pass it the text of that client object I created. And then it can just return the detected language dot name. So it abstracts away all of that messing around with the JSON and the rest, and it just makes it a native command and a native library. So it makes it much, much nicer for me. So th there's options available. So if I was writing in a language that had an SDK, hey, most likely you're gonna use the SDK. It's a far more pleasant experience than trying to mess around directly with that. So we're gonna think in terms of, of using the SDK if we can. Now the next thing we always think about is, hey great, we created this resource. 
but it, it costs money. It's an Azure resource. Now, as we saw, if I do the single service, there is a free option with a certain amount of included. But outside of using that free, let's go over here, what are we paying for? It's an Azure service. So an Azure service means it's consumption based. I'll pay on the number of interactions I do against it. And we can look at the pricing page. And the pricing page will tell us, hey, for the different services and the different regions, hey, if I was using computer vision, now it's a dollar per thousand until I get into higher numbers and it's 40 cents per thousand. I'm just paying for what I use, which again is very, very typical. There's a pricing calculator. So the pricing calculator, I could go through and I could add Azure Cognitive Services as we see right here. And that would then allow me to estimate. So if I added Azure Cognitive Services, I could tell it, well, which service? Notice it's telling me, oh, there's free by default over here. And if it's free, what do I get? And how oh, okay, I can do 5,000 text records of the following six features, or I change it to the standard plan. And then, hey, it's billing me based on, and I would tell it number of records and how I want to use it each month, or I want to use a different service or face API or maybe I want to use Q&A Maker. Whatever I want to do, I can go through the pricing calculator to actually go and get the detail on what that thing is going to actually cost me so I can plan ahead for how I'm going to use that. And as I showed before, single service, you have that free option. Multi-service, you do not. I'm always paying if it's, if it's that version. Now, one of the things I might want to do is alerting. So, hey, for my pricing, I can absolutely set budgets and a budget could be set on one of two things. It could be based on the actual spend I've done so far, or it could be based on forecasted. So, hey, based on the trend line you're at right now, if you carry on, uh, you're gonna bust your budget. And so it could alert you, it could send an email, a text message, integrate with an ITSM, call a serverless function like a Azure function or a Logic app, call a webhook. Lots of different options around that. I can use the Azure Cost Management Billing to go and see what it's actually costing me. Now, in addition to the, from the cost element, there are whoops, a whole set of metrics. So we do have metrics available, which again can be used also to do alerts. So I could do alerts for metrics, I could actually do alerts based on my costs. And once again, those alerts could call an action group, which is a common thing in Azure, but I could do many, many different things. Now, in addition to the basic metrics, there is the idea of logs. And there's different logs, for example, around audit. Um, it could be request, I think response. There's tracing. And all of these, if I need that data, I enable through something called diagnostic settings. So these, I ha these are not created by default. I have to turn them on if I need that. Metrics I can optionally include in this. And what this would then do, diagnostic settings lets me send it to a number of different places. I could send it to Log Analytics Workspace, which is Azure Monitor Logs. I could send it to an Event Hub. Event Hub is a publish, subscribe. And that would be really useful if I had something like an external SIM system, and the SIM system wanted to come and grab those, the security information, the event management solution, which it could then subscribe and take them from here and do something else. Or I could just send it to a storage account if I just need to store it for a long time as cheaply as possible. So there's many different things I can do to interact. But the, the key point around all of this is we're creating an Azure cloud resource. So it's in Azure, we might be calling it from an Azure service, it could be a service on premises, could be a service anywhere we want, but it's talking to the service that is running in the cloud and I'm paying for it on that consumption basis. 
And that's the, the common way we're gonna leverage these services. However, sometimes the cloud is not a fit. Imagine a scenario, we talked about some of the safety elements. So if we think about some of our goals over here, reliability and safety. Imagine this was that autonomous vehicle idea and imagine it was driving the car or object detection. Am I okay with the idea that, well, it's good as long as I've got a 5G connection? That may not be attractive to me. My car should always work. So sometimes I need to run the trained model at the place. So maybe it's because of it wouldn't have consistent network connectivity. Maybe it's a safety feature like in a factory and it's a camera looking for a, a dangerous um, circumstance and I can't accept the latency of going to the cloud and getting the response back. It would take too long. So there are scenarios where milliseconds count and I don't want to run it in the cloud. So one option is why I provision it in Azure, which is, which is absolutely the normal way I would do these things. But we do have another way. I can take the model and I can deploy it as a container. So my other option right here, and we'll do this as a, a I'll do it as green to show on premises, but it doesn't have to be on premises. It could really be anywhere. But my other choice for my provisioning, I'm gonna go up here so I have some space. I could provision it. is I'm gonna use containers. So over here, I've got this idea of containers. Now I'm not gonna talk about what is containers. I've got lots of different videos on my channel about that. But the point here is there is some kind of host, a container host, could be Windows, more often it's Linux. And what containers do is they create these user mode sandboxed environments that are isolated from each other in a user mode. And I run a certain container image. So this is container one, this is container two, etc. And what I'm doing is I'm running a certain image. Now, okay, what, what image am I running here? So the whole point, what Microsoft are doing for us here is we get these images from a registry. In this case, e.g., there is a Microsoft container registry. I don't think it's actually MCR anymore. I think they've got a different name. I think it's the Microsoft Artifact Registry because now it's more than just containers, but it's still MCR, I think, .microsoft.com. And what's happening here is I can create container images. Now, a container image is fundamentally layers because I create an image built on a layer, built on a layer, built on a layer. So someone creates a Docker file, which is the definition of what I want. Now my Docker file starts with a from. So I'm building from another image, which I can get from a registry. And then what I do is I basically create my, a new image that I can then publish. And then when I want to go and create something, I run it. So I run a certain image on a container host to create a new container running that code. And the whole point here is, because this is nothing to do with containers whatsoever, well here's where it is containers, there are Azure Cognitive Services set of container images, which I can use. Now, when I run them, I have to specify a few key things. I have to do an API key. I have to have billing, and I have to accept the EULA. Because you're still using their intellectual property. So you still have to pay, it's not free. So I still require the endpoints, that's the endpoint URI, of the service, that's still one of the keys. It has to have some internet connectivity so it can still go and report these things and I have to say yes to the EULA to be able to leverage that. So they're the key parameters and we can see this. Now, in terms of what is available, so these are all the Azure Cognitive Service containers. 
and it lists them all. So here's all the different ones I could use. If we go and look at one of them, so it talks about, hey, the different model, the prereqs, let me pick a different one. Oh, there we go, image, that's what I meant to click. I meant to click the image, there we go. So this is a link to the image, and what it will show you is the pull command. If I can see it, there we go. And what you can see is I'm pulling it from mcr.microsoft.com. It's Azure Cognitive Services, and in this case then it's Vision Read. So that's how I actually use it. So I can go and pull these images, but what's important if I go and look at some of the samples for the using of it, if we actually go and look at all of the different elements to use the image, I must have these arguments. I must accept the EULA, I must give it the API key, and I must give it the billing endpoint. So you can see that's the endpoint. So for me to be able to use one of these containers, I still have to have that connectivity. because so it has to be able to check in. It has to be able to connect to a particular endpoint and give me the key to prove I'm allowed to use it. I just go and build someone else. Um, but I have that. Let's just get that correct. Because it's a dash, not an underscore. There we go. So I would accept this. That's one of the keys. And that's the thing. So I have to have that to be able to use that container. But now I can go and run it wherever I want. And that's the beauty of what those capabilities are going to give me. So if I don't want to run it in the cloud, anywhere I can run a container, I could run the service, but it is not air gapped. I still have to be able to talk to Azure for the billing purposes to make sure it's charging me for using that intellectual property. So that, that's really the, the key goal around that. Okay, so let's actually go and look in a bit more detail about some of these services and actually what they're doing. So if we start with the idea of the visual perception and we had this image analysis. So if we think image analysis, and I'm gonna try and alternate between colors as I draw these so it's clearer as we go through. So for image analysis, this is the idea that we send it an image and then we're going to get a JSON response. So the JSON response is going to give me information about the image with a certain confidence level. So if I think, okay, image analysis, we have some idea that, hey, I'm sending it a picture. I mean, that's supposed to be a car, but I don't know. On a road, maybe the sun is shining, whatever that is. So it could give, for example, an image description. That might be useful for captioning purposes. So what I would get here is it might say, hey, it's car on road. That would be a description. So I needed to automatically caption images. Hey, I can use that description. It can also give me the idea of a category. So this maybe is vehicle. It would be the category. It could have tags. So the tag might be car, sun, but the category overall might be vehicle. And then also it might have object. So an object would say, hey, it's a car. Here's the X and the Y top left, and then the width and the height. So when we, we think of X, Y, it's kind of the left and the top is how it describes it. So in that case, it would be doing this kind of, it's giving me this coordinate. Oh, and then, oh, stop doing that. and then by you adding the width and the height, you work out the surrounding rectangle from it, but it's giving me that left top, and then I can go from there. So this really is useful for getting information. It can also do content moderation. So it could scan for adult or violent images, and I would get a rating. There's also a celebrity celebrity recognition, but you have to be onboarded. Anything where it talks about identifying people, there's special onboarding and permissions I have to give. Again, think responsible AI. There's special things that you have to onboard to to be able to use those technologies. Um, it can also do a smart 
thumbnail. So if I gave it a really big picture and said, hey, create me a smart thumbnail, it would use AI to identify well, what's the main subject of this picture, i.e. the car, and they could create me a thumbnail just cropped to the car of a size that I give it. Then I can think about the idea, and let's alternate to a slightly different color every time. Uh, we'll, we'll go orange, that's probably a bad color. We'll go light blue. So if then if I think about video analysis, let's draw this picture up here. So video analysis is doing similar ideas, but now I could think about, well, there's a whole set around facial recognition. So detecting the presence of individual people in an image. Again, that requires that approval. It might be optical character recognition again, and I can I have elements of that in here as well. So hey, it's seeing text within the video. It could have the idea of speech. Uh, transcription, so create a text transcription of the dialogue. It could also identify key topics that are in the video. It could have sentiment. Hey, is this a positive video? Is this a negative video? It could also have the idea of label. Okay, so what type of labels might I apply to this video, the key themes or objects within the video? Once again, I have ideas of content moderation. So I could think about adult or violent themes and giving me a confidence rating that that, that is part of that content. And also I can do the scene segmentation. So when there's a major shift in what it's doing, it can identify. Now there's also custom insights. So people, if I, I could train it on specific people, I want it to recognize as part of this. Again, I need that limited access approval. Language, if I have specific terminology used in my uh, industry or my company, I can train it to detect and transcribe um, language that's specific to me. Brands, I have specific brands I want it to recognize, products, projects, companies, even animated characters, I can recognize as well if I go and train that. So that's possible for me to do. Then I can think about image classification. So for image classification, should we come back over here again? So let's do that similar idea. But here the idea of the image classification is I want it to predict a class label based on the main subject of an image. It's a vehicle, it's a plane, it's a fruit, it's a vegetable. And the goal around what we're going to do here is we have to train it. So we'll start off with a bunch of data. Let's say that's a car, and I label it. So I'm labeling it. We use that label data to do the training to create the model. And then what I can do in the future is just send it other images, pretend that's a car, and it will predict, oh, it's a car with a certain confidence out of one, so 0.95 or whatever that is. So I'm using this to go and train my own classifications um, for images. Now, there's probably multi-class. Multi-class means there are multiple possible labels, categories, but an image will only be one of them. It can only be car or it can be vegetable. There's also multi-label. So multi-label would let me have one image where it could have multiple labels attached to it. And once again, because we have these phases of training, and then I should, I'll make this clear, prediction, oh, sorry, prediction, I can absolutely split those into different resources. So one resource I use for the training, we saw that at the start, one resource I use for the prediction. Um, I can use the custom vision portal, but I could also use the REST API, the SDK to upload image, label them, and then do all of that classification. Then there's object detection, I think that's fairly obvious. That goes another step and identifies the location of specific classes of object. Again, we think about training it, we'll give it data, but then actually give it the 
bounding rectangle of the object. And once again, I could do portal, REST API, or SDK. Then we get the, the facial analysis. Um, the facial analysis is very interesting because there's a whole set of different services when I think about this face service. And obviously, when we think about faces, there's a lot of personally identifiable information. We have to think about responsible AI with a face. Obviously, it's PII. It's someone's face. I need to ensure the privacy of that information. I need to be transparent about how that facial data is going to be used. And it needs to make sure it works for all individuals. And remember that treating everyone equally. It's why things like age and gender have been removed. So I remember in the old days when I would play around with this, I could walk up to it, it would be like bald, 100% male, and it would guess my age. It doesn't do that, it doesn't, doesn't say your gender anymore, it doesn't say age anymore, because obviously it could be wrong, and it could call offen offense to people, so that has been removed. It will not say gender, it will not say age. So those, those have been removed from it. There's actually two services that can help with facial analysis. There is just the general computer vision service. Um, but the general compute, computer vision service would just say, hey, there's a face and here's where it is. Then there's the separate face service. Now the face service goes a lot further. Yes, there's a face, but then here's its attributes. Do they have glasses? What's the pose of the head? Uh, I can do verification, I could do recognition around all of those things. So yes, we get the face rectangle, the top left coordinate, and then the width and the height, sure. But then we get additional information. Hey, here's where the nose is, here's where the eyes are, how much blur is in the picture, how much exposure is in the picture. So I get the idea of sure where it is, but I also get information about it but then it can also do detection and it can do verification. Now, when I think about this is what it's going to do is for the detection, every face it sees will get a unique ID generated for it. Now this will get cached for 24 hours. I'm actually gonna write that in. After which time it will be discarded. So what this is useful is imagine if it can detect and verify a particular face within a limited window, how you came into a building and you've left the building. And that, that would be one case of that. So it doesn't remember, you need to remember you long, long term, but it's gonna remember the face for 24 hours. So it could validate those types of scenarios. Then we also can have the idea of recognition. Now as the recognition, is not gonna just last 24 hours. This is a much longer term thing. And what we do here is we have the idea if we create a person group, and then we have the idea of kind of uh, person one, person two, person three, and we give it a bunch of images. They, they would actually look something like the person, etc. And now you're training it to recognize specific people. So I'm gonna have multiple images of people, ideally in multiple poses, and that will be persisted. That's not gonna expire after 24 hours. That, that would be pretty use, useless if it did expire after 24 hours. Then obviously optical character recognition. Now again, um, we have two different APIs we can use for this. The primary one we wanna use is the read API. The read API is really useful. I can read from images. I can read from PDF documents. And it could be both small to large, like huge amounts of data in terms of volume. I could take entire books, entire magazines. There's also the image analysis API. So this, the Read API has got really good accuracy. I can do printed text in multiple languages. I think it's over 160. It can do handwritten. In fact, let's look at that quickly. So if I looked at, again, we're looking right near at the Read. 
It talks about all the different image formats. It talks about PDF and TIFF, up to 2,000 pages, again paid, must be less than 500 megs or four megs for the free tier, uh, 50 by 50 or up to 10,000 by 10,000, PDF, no limit. Then it talks about uh, 164 print languages, nine languages for handwritten text. So we, we get some of the ideas of what it's capable of. And the way this uses it, because it could be far, far larger amounts of data, there's gonna be a call we make which gives us an asynchronous ID. Then we make a subsequent call to get the results for that ID. The image analysis API is for small amount of text for an image. Uh, it gives us the line number position of the text, but it's a single synchronous call. I mean, obviously it can identify other things like brands and faces, image categorization. So if it's just a very limited amount of text, maybe it's as part of something else, sure, the image analysis API can do it. But our main sort of star service for OCR in any kind of large volume uh, will be the read API. That's gonna be the main one. Okay, so then if we carry on thinking about all our different capabilities, let's go and look down. Our next thing would be language understanding. So if I think for language understanding, I went over my space a little bit over here. So for my language understanding, we'll go and carry it on, give myself a lot of space, we'll go over here. There's different elements to define and train models to predict user intent from natural language. Um, now there are certain learned, so from a learned perspective, I'm doing the training. And I'm gonna come back to those. Then there's also the idea of pre-configured. Now, some of the pre-configured, we're actually gonna come back, some of the those topics up there. But in addition, there's things like summarization and PII detection. So summarization, hey, give it a bunch of text and it's gonna break it into key senten sentences that predict the overall meaning of it. PII detection, hey, there's IP addresses, there's email, there's home addresses or street addresses, there's names, there's protected health information that it's gonna find. And again, there's the question answering text analysis we're gonna come back to. Then I can really think about these learned features and I have to train these. It's custom language to understand the user's intent. So we have this idea of custom language understanding, CLU. And the whole goal here is, right, we have to train it. We have to train it on a certain intent and to understand that particular intent, well, here are the possible utterances. that map to that intent. So for example, the intent could be get time. The utterances could be, what is the time? What time is it? Tell me the time. There may even optionally be an entity that it relates to. What is the time in London? And when I think about the entities, there are pre-built entities. So if we go and look at the pre-built entities, there's a whole bunch of them. Because the age, number, percentage, ordinal, dimensions, temperature, currency, emails. I mean, there's a whole bunch of these. So there are all of these just pre-built ones. Or I could train it with my own ones. I can train the entities as well. And once again, like all of these things, there's going to be this loop of training. So the idea would be, I, I train, I train it, I test it, I deploy it, I review what it's doing, and I use that to train it some more. So there's always these cycles around all of this. There's also then the idea of custom named entities. 
So these are particular entities. I want it to train it to understand. So this could be a person, a place, a thing, an event, a skill, a value. So I'm just gonna define the entities I want. I'm gonna label existing data that corresponds to the entity. I wanna make it as accurate as possible. Remember, we're training it. If we're not accurate in our training, that's gonna impact everything else that it's gonna be able to do. And the way I do this is I'm gonna pass an array of labels and then give it a certain entity that those labels would represent. I could do it from the portal. Uh, I can do it again through that JSON. And I want a diverse set as possible. So the whole point here is I have a whole bunch of data with the labels, and I'm gonna pass all of this as, as everything we're ever gonna do here, basically JSON. Then there's also custom text classification. So custom text classification, I think is, is fairly obvious. I'm gonna document text to be classified into custom groups. Now there's a number of different ways I could actually think about having this. There's both single label and multi-label. So if I think about single, I'm gonna always do this. So single label, I have a bunch of possible labels, L1, L2, L3, L4, whatever. And then I have a whole bunch of different texts. Single level says, single label says, hey, you can only be one particular label. Multi-label, exactly the same thing bunch of different labels, bunch of different texts. But the key point here now is a text could be multiple labels. That's all that means. So I can, for custom text classification, is it, hey, I just have one label for a certain set of data or do I allow multiple? Now with this, once again, we're gonna train the data. So I'm gonna define my labels. I'm going to tag my sample data. I'm gonna train the model. Now, when I do training, remember there's the training and then there's the testing. So my data set will get split between an amount of data I'm using for the training, then the amount of data I'm using to test, well, is it trained correctly? Is it accurately um, labeling, classifying based on what I would expect? Now I can view the model details to improve, it may be misclassifications, I might get false positives, so it's predicting something when the file isn't actually that. I might get false negatives. It doesn't predict the label, but the label should have been tagged at that. So I'm gonna get these various scores. Now, there are two things that I think are really important to understand. There's a whole bunch of different things I will get, but there's two values. One of them is called recall. And one of them is called precision. Recall is of the actual labels, how many were identified? So the ratio of true positives to all that were labeled. So what does that mean? So imagine I searched for pizza. So we're always gonna search for pizza, okay? So we're searching for pizza. And what was returned to me was four documents, but Three of them were correct. One of them was just a, a misnomer. We'll do it red. So it returned me three, but there were actually three more that it didn't return to me. So this is the set of data that got returned to me. Three of them were correct but it missed three. So in this case, my recall here would be three, oops, out of a possible six. So 0.5 would be my recall because it missed some. So it only gave me three out of what it should have responded to me. Precision, if we take this exact same scenario again, 
Well, it gave me four documents, but three of them were actually correct. So now my precision would be three out of four. So 0.75. So recall how many out of what it should have responded did it give me? So it recalled half of what it should have done. Precision, well, what it responded to me, three quarters of them were actually correct. And they can combine those in something called an F score, like F so F1 score is a function of the recall and precision. So it gives me a nice balance of how good that actually was. So that, that's a, a good thing to understand if I'm trying to understand, well, how good a job is this thing actually doing? Uh, we like to look at that. So those are important concepts to understand. Recall, how many out of what it could have returned did it? And then precision, out of what it returned, how many of them were correct? And then if we come all the way back up to here, there were the other pre-configured ones I talked about. So for example, question answering. So question answering is mostly about a pre-configured feature. I'm gonna give me answers to questions that are provided as input. And I'm gonna have, the way this is actually gonna work is, what I want to create, let's get my colors back. So for question answering, what I'm going to create is a knowledge base. So I can think about this huge knowledge base that I'm creating, that's supposed to be a book. And that knowledge base is coming from a number of different places. So what I can read into this is maybe it's uh, pointing to a fact that is online that it can read in. Maybe I'm passing it files. Uh, maybe I have some chit chat files. So I have chit chat. So I'm feeding in all of that information. And then what I can do with that is I can now use that from my chat assist assistant. So I've got these Q question and answer pairs that I have defined. Now I may also define synonyms. Maybe there's multiple words that actually mean the same thing. But then I'm gonna feed it in. So I'm probably gonna have some bot that is a question that will feed it into the restful endpoint. And then what it's gonna give me back is an answer. Now it's gonna be JSON, as always. That's gonna have the matched question based on, so I've got natural language going in. It's gonna use the service to equate that to a specific question. It's gonna give me the answer and a confidence score. It's gonna tell me what the source of the answer was and maybe other information, other prompts that could be applicable. Now as part of this interaction, I could say, don't just give me one answer, I could use top. So top would say top three, it would give me the top three answers, the, the highest predicted confidence score first out of one and then going down. It could be a multi-turn type interaction. There could be a follow-up prompt. It might be waterfall where I'm expecting it to say one thing and then it gives a prompt, then I go to the next thing, prompt and then I go to the next. Like, there could be a whole series of interactions. It might have a follow-up. Hey, cancel my reservation. Was it a flight or hotel reservation? There, there can be different types of interactions that I need to do with that. And then for text analysis, so we're up here, go back to our other color. Designed to help me extract information from text. And there's a whole bunch of different features that I would think about for the text analysis. So I'll give myself enough space. So just come down to here this time. So text analysis. Well, I could obviously think about language detection. What language is this? So I could say, hey, language detection. So that could be language equals English. I might want key phrase extraction. So this is AI, it's Azure. It could be sentiment analysis. How um, positive, positive 0.9, neutral 0.1, negative 0.0, hopefully. 
but I can have a sentiment analysis of the video. It could be named entity recognition. Now it will not recognize John Savile, I'm a nobody, but maybe I trained it. John Savile. It might even have entity linking. So entity linking could then actually have a specific instance of that, maybe linking to, for example, a Wikipedia article. So it can help disambiguate common entities with the same name. So imagine I said boots. Well, boots could be a type of shoe. It could be a brand of chemist in England. So that's where entity linking could help me if there are entities that share the same name, but are obviously very, very different. So that's where I can leverage that. And then I can think about this idea of translation. Now, there are some overlaps in some of these things. So once again, when I think translation, well, over here, I can obviously have the idea of language um, detection. So, hey, very similar to that text analysis over there. But one of the great things I can do here is a one-to-many translation. And again, think this could be combined with other services. So maybe I go and use the read API to read in a whole set of books and then pass it to the translation and do a one-to-many to convert it to French and German and Spanish and whatever I want, I could feed that into. And there's also options like word alignment, uh, profanity filtering. So I could either delete it or mark it with a, a character like an asterisk put in style. So if it could also take that out of language it finds. And there's also trans literation. So transliteration is converting text from a native script to an alternative script. So maybe a word from one alphabet to a different alphabet. So it's not converting the language, but it's converting hey, the, the alphabets it's using. I can also have custom translations, so specific business, specific industry, vocabulary, vocabularies that I need as part of my custom translations. So I can add in all of those um, different capabilities as well. Then, if we, if we go to the next area of what we're focusing on, obviously we have the idea of speech. Now there's different aspects when we think of speech. Speech to text may be fairly obvious. An API that's speech recognition. I can accept spoken or maybe it's from a file. So there's two different APIs. There's a speech to text API which is the primary way to perform speech recognition. There's actually a speech to text short audio API for up to 60 seconds. Now there are some specific configuration files we have as part of this. So we have this idea of a speech config. And as part of our speech config, we're gonna have to give it the location and the key to use this, and then optionally, we can have an audio config. We don't have to have that, but the audio config could override the default input. Input. So instead of it being, for example, the system microphone, it could be a different one. And then what these are actually gonna go and do to use this, these will go and create a um, speech recognizer object. So it might be a speech recognizer in this scenario for this speech to text. Now the other thing that would then do is it's gonna return information like the duration of it and the text. That, that's its key thing we can actually do. But we also then have text to speech. Now we actually have these same files for the text to speech. If this is here, we also link that same idea from text to speech. So we still use these files here as well. But now that speech config, because now what we wanna do is have text 
and speak it. So once again, we have this text-to-speech API. There's also a text-to-speech long audio API. So that's to, for batch operations. I actually want to take a whole book and convert that text to audio so I can leverage that. And that's the same speech config file, but now I can also have things like the audio format. Um, I can have voices that I want to use can get read into that. Once again, the audio config could override where I want to go it to the mic, to the speakers, or maybe to a file. And this time, what these are gonna create is a speech synthesizer. Can't even spell that today. Synthesizer. It's like, it's 6 a.m. right now, so forgive me for not being able to do silly things. And the whole point of some of this is when I think of this text to speech, there's actually two different ways I can feed this in. Yes, I can just feed it in text, but I can also feed it in SSML. So SSML is speech synthesis markup language. So what that's gonna let me do is I can have speaking styles, pauses, pronunciations, pitch, rate, and more. I can have multiple voices. So yes, I could just have a very basic text which would use the same for all of it, or I could use the SSML if I wanted variations in actually what I'm doing as part of that. So if I want a richer output dialogue, I can leverage that. There's also the speech translation. So if I think about speech translation, let's come over here. So this is, yes, speech to text. So I can have the idea of, hey, we need the source and the target language. We use those short country codes. So let's have a look for a second. So here, if we look at translation, what we're gonna leverage is this language code as part of this. So it's always gonna be this very short uh, language code here. Sometimes you'll see it's a, a dash because there's different variances of the language. So if I looked at United States, uh, is that in here? It's weird. Okay, maybe it's not here on this one. But you can see this Chinese simplified as a variation there. French Canadian, can see there are some variances for some of the languages. So I'm gonna use those short codes. So if I'm specifying the source or the target, doesn't matter what I'm doing, I'm gonna use those short codes as part of that. So here what we can do, we specify these as part of a speech translation configuration. And so what this would take is the speech would come in and we would get the original language text, but also the translated text as well. So it's gonna do multiple for us. What we can also do is we can synthesize translations. I have to spell it now. Now, what this is really doing is combining multiple things. Hey, I have to take the speech understand what it is, and then straight away take the text, translate it, and then speak it. Now, I can make this event-based. So it's just gonna trigger straight away, but only if it's a one-to-one. -one. one input language in, one output language. Or I can manually do this if it's a one-to-n. So it's obviously an A language coming in, but I wanna convert it to three or four different languages. There's also speaker recognition. Hey, recognize individual speakers based on their voice. There's also an intent recognition where I can understand the semantic meaning of the spoken input. So there are different uh, capabilities around there. And then the last of these broad kind of categories is we have this idea of anomaly detection. So normally detection, there's really two types. We're looking at one signal 
So you have some signal and then it goes outside. So then we have this variance outside that, or maybe it's multi. So there's a whole set of different signals and it's when there's some combination over those signals. Now, that's probably gonna be a more complicated system or maybe a manufacturing piece of equipment where there's a correlation of there's an impending failure or an issue when there's multiple signals I need to understand. There's Azure Content Moderation, and this is gonna work for both images and text. And the goal here is for images. Um, is it image adult classified or is image racy classified? So there's different levels. So image adult would be presence of images that are sexually explicit or adults in situations. Racy could be sexually suggestive or mature in certain situations. Text, well, profanity, um, which could, I could have categories of offensive, sexually explicit, sexually suggestive, and um, personal data, email, address, IP, phone numbers. So we have all of those um, content areas around there. And then content personalization is really just around the best decision. So I could think again the shopping cart idea. We're gonna have reinforcement learning where, hey, we suggest something, was this good or bad? And it can then learn from that to have better suggestions. So we see this, hey, recommend you watch this movie next, oh, thumbs down, don't like that movie. Okay, that's reinforcement learning. So then the next time my media service is suggesting a movie, hopefully it will get it better. So there's this learning loop and we have the idea of rankings and rewards based on what that's actually giving me. So that's obviously, we see that all the time in everything we do. We get these suggestions and recommendations and sometimes we're like, we are not interested in this. And we tell it that and we tell it that so hopefully it will improve next time by not suggesting that thing to me again. And then we move into the idea of the pre-built solutions. So the pre-built solutions, all those other things I have to do something with. I have to build my solution to use it. That's the whole point. These perform a function without me potentially having to do anything. So the forms recognizer, I mean, this, this is obviously a, a very common thing we might want to do. Now, there are pre-built models Now the whole goal of what we can do here is, I could have things like a JPEG, I can have a PNG, a PDF, a TIFF, and it could be 500 meg max. So these are using OCR, but it's also ideas about looking at this and is there key value pairs, are there selection marks, maybe even tables from the documents. So it's 500 megs, four megs from using the free version, uh, 10,000 by 10,000 max pixel size. And what it's gonna return me is JSON. Uh, JSON with the text, any bounding boxes, any selection marks. So all of these pre-built models are really powerful for things like uh, W2 forms, invoices, receipts, ID documents, business cards. And I just call the analyze function and, and it's gonna be a get result, and it's gonna have a result ID, and then I give that result ID to retrieve the actual result. Or I might wanna create a custom model. Now obviously a custom model, there's more work that I'm gonna to have to do to make this actually function and do what I need to, to function. So my, my goal with this would be, I would obviously have to create a whole set of training data. So I'd have a whole set of the forms I want to train it on. I'd have the different optical character recognition and the labels. So what I'll do is I'll build this out. Now I could either use the Forms Recognizer Studio to bring this in to label and train it or I could have sample data in a blob container, so an Azure storage account, put it in blob, and then there'll be corresponding JSON files. 
So for every document, there'll be an OCR file and a label file. And then also I'll have one fields file. So all of these are JSON documents. But the point is there'll be an OCR and a label for every form and then one fields JSON and then I use this to train. Because this is obviously telling me the text from the OCR, hey, where this is, the data I have, the OCR layout, and then the actual labels that it should have based on that content of what the fields that are available are for it. So I can train it to create my own. Uh, Metrics Advisor, uh, we saw that anomaly detection, it's just a pre-built solution for data monitoring and anomaly detection in time series data. I can tune the detection model, I can help trigger alerts. Uh, video Analyzer, again, using those visual services we saw, but now it's just a complete video analyzer service that can do that scene segmentation, the content labeling, shot detection, people tracking, face identification, audio transcription, closed captioning, speaker enumerations, speaker stats, emotion detection, all of those things. Immersive Reader is really nice. So this is one of the ideas that it can make content available to anyone. And this is actually probably best by just looking at the documentation. But the point here is, we could make it easier to read, so we could isolate out text. It could display pictures. It could highlight it differently to help understand what it's doing. It can even read it to me. It can even translate it. It can split it into syllables. So it talks about, hey, we just create this iframe that's calling this, and it will make it easier for people to absorb. So this really is about bringing it to anybody. It's gonna make it very easily accessible to leverage the content. Okay, so now we get to the bot service. Oh, didn't mention that at all. Nope, one more time. Why is that not undoing? Come on. All right, it's not liking me today. All right, I'm gonna have to just accept the weird line. I think I make my balls at a certain point so big um, certain functions just stop working properly anymore. It's probably undoing something else. So we'll redraw in enrich. So if you think about the bot service, this is really powerful. These conversational interactions we see time and time again now. There are turns initiated by an activity. A user joins a conversation, uh, sends a message. Now the messages could be text, it could be speech, it could be a visual interface like a card or a button. And we can maintain state if we have a multi-turn type dialogue. And once again, I can have multiple channels for a single solution. I can have web chat and email and Teams. I can define all of this. Now there's really three layers to this solution. So I could think about, well there's the Azure bot service, The Azure bot service is exposed. There is a bot framework service. This itself has a RESTful endpoint. And then there is a bot framework SDK. That calls this. And then of course I do my development against the SDK. So there's this complete set. And there are templates available. There is a, an empty bot, just a basic bot skeleton. There's an echo bot that's like a hello world that just echoes the message back. And there's a core bot that has some core functionality integration with the language understanding service. And what I need to do is implement activity handlers. So the idea here is there are event methods that I'm gonna override to handle different types of activity. There'll be a turn context that will show the, show the text of the text received. There are dialogues for more complicated handling of stateful multi-turns. And we're gonna have a recognizer. The recognizer is going to interpret the user's input. We're gonna have a trigger to respond to the detected intent 
and then a language generator to formulate the output to the actual user. There is a local bot framework emulator, so I don't have to go and use the cloud. I can run this locally in my development environment. And again, a single bot can be developed, uh, delivered through multiple channels. Uh, there's a bot framework composer, there's a bot framework SDK, there are power virtual agents for no code, that's part of the Microsoft Power Platform, to make it easier for your citizen developers to actually go and create these solutions. And then finally, when I think of these pre-built solutions, uh, and I guess the final key thing we'll focus on, that's part of, at time of recording, the topics, is the Azure Cognitive Search. Now this is so powerful. It's so powerful today, but it's even getting more and more powerful when we start to think of what's coming down the future of large language models and using our data as part of them. Because really what happens is we have huge amounts of data um, and we wanna be able to extract information and make it available in different ways to be consumed. So the point of Azure Cognitive Search is it's a cloud-based solution for the indexing and then the querying on a huge wide range of data sources. So I can index data that could be, actually maybe I, I should put this in. So I could think about data could be in blob, that data could be in tables in a database, that data could be in Cosmos DB, but it could also be something else. I can use things like Azure Data Factory to bring in data, which could then bring that into the data. Now, if I use Azure Data Factory, there are some limitations. Um, I'm gonna use the index REST API to do a push into the search index. I can't handle complex data types like arrays. Um, I'd have to make sure I'm not being throttled or a certain document in a batch fails, but it really opens it up to anything. But I then can use cognitive skills to enrich this data. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But I, I have the ability to do other things with this, um, to leverage and maybe take images, extract the text from the image, and then add it to the index. I could make, hey, I need this particular field translated so it will work across different languages. Now, this is its own service. So when I think about cognitive search, because this is a complete solution, it's not available as part of like that multi-service, I create a Azure cognitive search resource. And there are different tiers available. I can think there's a free, uh, basic, I think standard, and then a storage optimized, which is the L. So, hey, obviously free, I can go and play around with it, but I'm limited on what I can do. Basic, there's a limited amount of data I can index. Standard, there's different sizes within standard, increasing um, scale and indexes. And then L is the storage optimized, really, really large indexes. And obviously the cost, I need to look at these to make sure I'm optimizing how I spend my money. So what I'm really gonna get is this giant index. Well, to use a giant index, there's two things. I have to be able to store it, and then I have to be able to index, talk to it, to search from it. And so I have the idea that I can have replicas. So I could have, for example, replica one, uh, maybe I've got replica two, replica three, n numbers. So these I could think about as different interaction, so I could load balance the queries against these to improve my scale, improve my resiliency if there was a failure. So maybe I've got a replica three as well. So I've got these different replicas. And then within the replica, I have partitions. It's partition one, partition two, partition three, partition, etc. cetera. Um, so how I can think about this is every replica will have the same number of partitions. So if I have three replicas and four partitions, what each of these is, is a search unit. So my number of search units 
is the number of replicas times by the number of partitions. And then even the search unit actually gets sharded uh, to handle some of the ways it does some of its own interactions. Now obviously the more replicas I have, um, the, the better my resiliency gets as well. Now if we search about reliability in Azure Cognitive Search, it talks about we well, could just do a single one. There's availability zones, remember? So availability zones are distinct sets of data centers in a region with their own power, calling, networking. It talks about high, avail high availability, but notice, hey, if I want the three nines, so for read only, I need two replicas. I need three replicas for three nines of read and write. So that might guide how many replicas I want. If I want the three nines, if it's just read, I need two replicas. If I want read write, I need three replicas. So this would give me three nines for read and write. Just that would give me three nines uh, for just read purposes. And I can have up to 36. So 36 is the max. Now I can get to that 36 through different combinations of partitions and replicas. That is really up to me. Now there are other components that actually come into this. So I talked about this idea of this enrichment. So this enrichment actually comes from a skill set. So we have these skill sets that do enrichment. And one of the things the enrichments may do is, hey, maybe it is calling something else and it is extracting other information. Maybe I want that as well. So yes, I want it to get added to the index, but I want to keep that enrichment. I want to project it into something else. So I can also project, so I can do a projection into a knowledge store. So I want to maintain that work in something else as well. Now that knowledge store, if it was objects, would be JSON. If it was um, relational schema data, it would go to a table. If it was just unstructured like an image, it would go to a file. So what that knowledge store actually is would vary, but I can absolutely do that. So then, great. Um, we have these capabilities, we have the index, we have the indexer, which is actually driving that mapping of the fields. Um, the index can be multi-language again. I can mark certain fields as needing translation as part of that. And when I talk about these skill sets, I can actually create my own custom skill. So I could create a custom skill. For example, I might use an Azure function. So that would have an endpoint, a URI. And what I could actually do now is I could point to a web API skill which points that URI to then be consumed as part of a custom skill. So I create an Azure function which has a URI, I create a custom skill which has a web API skill property which points to the URI of my Azure function and I'm good to go. There are again things like synonym maps where I have the same thing meaning the same um, entity. Uh, UK, GP, Great Britain, United Kingdom, although they're not exactly the same. Uh, maybe they're synonyms. If I want an actual field returned, I could mark it as retrievable. I can go beyond basic interactions and as someone's typing, I might want to autocomplete what they're typing. So there is an autocomplete option. So as I'm typing a word, it would say, hey, is this the word you're trying to finish? It could have suggestions. So as I'm typing, it would actually fill out entire suggestions for what I may be meaning to do. So there are particular capabilities that I register fields with a suggestor. So I have a suggest suggestor, my mouth's getting dry. So I have a suggestor, I register certain fields with that suggestor, and then I can use it for that auto completion for as part of those suggestions. There's a whole language studio that I can leverage with this. I can do a basic search but I can also use the Lucene query parser that's a more precise type query. I can boost certain terms by using the carrot, the little up arrow symbol. 
I could weight certain scoring profiles. Uh, if I had geographical data, I could use geospatial functions to return something closest to the point given. So there's, there's really powerful things I can do as part of this. Um, but, but that's really all of this is at time of recording the scope of the exam. Like you should have gone through the examples, you should understand all of these things and you should be good to go. I'm gonna cover one other thing. At time of recording is not in the exam, it's almost certainly will be added to the exam. So you should go and check that document and see what's in scope. You can ignore this if today it's not in scope, but it's, it's a really powerful component. And what that is, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll make it as a slightly different color to, to call it out that it's different today, is we have this Azure OpenAI. Now you have heard of this. You have heard, I did a whole video about large language models. So these are all about large language models. And there are different large language models. There are things like GPT 3.5 Turbo. There's version four, which at time recording is the newest one, but there's bound to be newer ones. There are embeddings to create vectors based on information. There's Dali where I give it a description and it goes and creates me a picture, uh, which I don't like. People keep using it to create pictures of me as some super villain or something else. But the whole goal of what happens here is these large language models were trained on vast, vast amounts of data. And it took huge amounts of computational power, huge amounts of money and huge amounts of time to create this large language, one of these particular models, like huge amounts of time. If you look at when it was trained on, a time of recording, like GPT-4 was trained on data only up to September, 2021. So that's a long time ago, but it's trained and that model really becomes this read only um, way to use it. And what's happening here with OpenAI, the Azure OpenAI, is we can now leverage instances of this model. And we can leverage it on it, we pay as we use it, the number of tokens we're doing. And I can do a number of different things with this, but the whole way we interact with these solutions is I am at basically my machine, and we prompt it. We give it some prompt, which we send to the large language model, and then what it is doing is an inference. And it passes that back. Now an inference is predicting the next most likely token and the next most likely token after that and that. On this phenomenally powerful billions of parameters, many, many layers, that when you do those things, again, based on fairly simple statistics, which is crazy, but it's trained, it's like a natural, I'm interacting with a human. It's very hard to tell the difference. And it's been trained on so much information, it seemingly knows nearly everything. If you look at things like all the Microsoft uh, GitHub Copilot, all the Copilots for Microsoft 365 and security and the Windows and Bing Chat, they're all using this. And they're not modifying the large language model. It, it takes so long to train, you can't retrain or tweak the model. The model is essentially read only which is like, oh, how is that working then? Well, I can use it for different things. There's completion, there's chat completion, where it's more about roles within message sending. Again, those, those embeddings where it's designed to return a vector. Vectors are very useful to summarize intents and relationships between different things. But when we send this prompt, I could ask it to summarize something. Um, give the sentiment of something, have a conversation with me, give me information. I can use the completions playground in the OpenAI Studio. I can test chat in the chat playground in the OpenAI Studio. But one of the most important things is this large language model is responding to the prompt. And so the more specific the prompt, the better the response will be. 
So there is this concept of, sure, I say prompt, but there's really this idea of, or there's what the users are putting in. But then I may also want to add the idea of a system prompt to give it more context, more useful information, or maybe I modify the prompt. So we always talk about this idea of uh, grounding. So if I'm grounding the prompt, I'm enhancing it. I'm making it better to make it more useful. Like the system prompt, I can use this when I'm interacting using, for example, chat completion. The system prompt might say, you are a helpful assistant. You are teaching people about Azure. You should be respectful and polite. If you do not know, you should, you're should. you giving it more instruction and then you give it the user's prompt, which may be a bit vague and may not give them the best response. So I can make it more descriptive, clearer of the actual expectations of what I want. I could tweak how the model responds with things like temperature and a top probability, make it more artistic and maybe more imaginative or maybe make it stricter. Uh, I can give it cues. Hey, I want you to start your response with, mm. So it helps make it better and better. But the other thing I could do is as part of this grounding, I can, because the, the question probably is, is well, okay, if it's trained on September, 2021, how is it telling me, how does Bing Chat possibly work? How can I make it use my data? So one of the things grounding can do is I can also describe to the large language model, these APIs are available to you. You could, if you want, ask me to go and find out about something. So you can describe an API, and instead of it returning a response that it goes to the user, it might actually return a plan. And the plan might say, right, you're essentially acting now as an orchestrator. I want you to go and find this out for me. So if it was Microsoft 365, as the user's context, go and run this search against Azure Cognitive Search to find these documents. And then what it could now do is in its response next time, this prompt could actually be built of, you can use like these three lines. So I might have information. Oh, I really, this, yeah, it doesn't work anymore, does it? So I might have my information that is requested and then I might have what the actual request is. So I could break it down into sections on what I'm actually doing. And so what that would enable me to do is I could now add my own data. And one of the nice things this studio does is my own data, is my own data could, I could upload it. It could be in Azure Storage as a blob. It could be in Cognitive Search Index. So now as part of this process, I bring in my data in and the Azure AI Studio will help me now use that and it would be used as part of those responses. So this is how it can do things with my data. So I could absolutely now expose it. So hey, you can go and search my knowledge base. So if people ask about my catalog, hey, you'd be able to actually chat and respond and give it information. Hey, it's a help desk API. Here's all the facts for previous problems we've ever had. You could now go and look up that information. So my first request you would be, hey, I'm stuck on this. Your first response may be a plan that says, hey, go and call the Azure Cognitive Search and search for these terms. And then I would follow up with the information, the previous prompt, so it has context of history, and then what my request is. And now it would have more information to craft a nicer response for me. So this is a very, very common thing. Um, it, for coding, there is not a separate codex model anymore. Uh, GPT-3, 5, Turbo, and 4 is just good enough but it could explain code, comment code, create documentation, complete code I've written, convert code from one language to another, um, create code based on a description, fix bugs, um, refactor code, make it better, uh, write unit tests. It's really just gonna help overall be more productive and better efficiency. So again, at time of recording, this is not in the exam. I fully expect it to be added to the exam at some point. So I guess, I mean, that that's it. That, that's the study cram. Uh, I really hope it's useful. My key recommendation would be go through the online learning. It's really everything you need, but go through the labs, get more familiar with it. You wanna be able to 
understand what every service does. So it's going to present you with, hey, how would you do this? Oh, okay, I'll use this solution and then that solution. Um, what are the types of functions and calls I might make? What information would I need? Um, what structure would those things maybe have? Again, I'm not writing code from scratch, but it may give me code and say, what is this doing? Would this do this? Um, what function would you do for this part of it? But if you go through and understand it, I, I think you, you'll be fine. Um, if you don't pass the first time, go and look at the descriptions, look at your weakest area and go and double down on that. But again, you have a huge amount of time. It may seem like an hour 40 is not that much, but I finished in 30 minutes and I actually pretty good. So you have time, you're not in a rush. Look at each question. You can mark some of them and come back to them if you're not sure later on. Sometimes if you're not sure, a question later on might actually give you a hint. It's like, oh wait, okay. I remember that, that sort of helps me answer the previous one. So you can come back and review it and answer it. Pay attention if it says you won't be allowed to come back to this section. Just make sure of those type things. Some of the questions you have to answer and you can't go back because it's gonna ask a series of questions, the same thing with just different possible answers. Would this do this? Well, would this do this? Would this do this? So it won't let you go backwards. So really think about uh, does it or does it not meet the requirements? But take your time, don't stress out about it and uh, good luck.